First Amendment to the United States Constitution reads in part, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Within this single phrase, there are two clauses. One is known as the Establishment Clause, and the other, the Free Exercise Clause. Since this language was agreed upon by the framers, many cases have been brought before the courts seeking answers to determine the meaning of each clause. Because we're talking about the religion clauses, there is a lot of debate amongst legal scholars as to how to interpret, interpret the religion clauses and how much attention we should pay to what the framers were thinking when they drafted it. If we sort of back away from the intricacies or the minute details that people love to argue about, what, what we can say is at least this. The religion clauses were initially enacted to number one, stop religious persecution from happening in the United States. And number two, stop the federal government from enacting a national religion. This question as to whether this prohibition against an establishment of religion or the free exercise clause was applicable to the states actually had to be resolved by the United States Supreme Court in the early 1900s. And when the court considered it, it decided it is absolutely true that the religion clauses are applicable to the states because of the 14th Amendment. The court took the position that these are very important fundamental kind of rights, and if the founding fathers thought about it, they really intended for these rights to apply to the states as well. The court uses the due process clause rationale to get to this conclusion, because basically the court says, no, it would just not be fair, not be right, substantively. Uh, for these rights, such as the freedom of religion, not to also apply to the states. The New York State Board of Regents, a state governmental agency, composed a non-denominational prayer and recommended its use to the state's public schools. Every school board in New York State was offered the prayer for their use, and participation was voluntary. In New Hyde Park, the Board of Education of Union Free School District No. 9 required its students to begin each school day by reciting the prayer aloud in class. The prayer was either led by the teacher or a student who had been chosen to do so. However, the parents of 10 students brought suit in a New York State court, challenging the constitutionality of the school board's policy. There were some parents in New York who felt that this, this prayer that students were were asked to say any prayer for that matter was a violation of the establishment clause that the public school requiring students or even just asking students to say a prayer was an indirect way of the state sponsoring a church. Parents uh, objected to the fact that the school prayer that was in question was written by the school officials and the parents thought that it was too much involvement and too much sponsorship of religion in the form of prayer from the state. The New York State courts, what they said is, we think it's okay because we have forced the school district to allow school children to opt out. So in other words, if their parents object to them saying the prayer, they can either stand there and say nothing or they can be excused from the room. And because we have these exceptions in the rule, basically they are not being coerced into praying. So therefore, it's not a violation of the, uh, of the religion clauses. After the New York Court of Appeals upheld the trial court's judgment, the parents appealed their case to the U.S. Supreme Court. The main question is, does the reading of a prayer at the beginning of a school day violate, in a public school, violate the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment? Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. The state said it's not a violation of the Establishment Clause because we are not forcing anyone to believe anything. We are expressing a common sentiment in the community. Students can pay attention to it. They cannot pay attention to it. Um, they can conform their beliefs to it if they choose, if they don't have to do anything. We're not being coercive. We're not making them believe or do anything. There's no coercion here. The United States Supreme Court said, why are you talking about coercion? This is an establishment clause problem and coercion has no relevance to this particular argument. 
coercion, whether it's present or not, is irrelevant to an established clause, establishment clause analysis. And so we're not going to consider that, and the New York state courts got it wrong. The parents of New York argued that the prayer violated the Establishment Clause, whether it was directly or indirectly violating the Establishment Clause. They, they didn't care. Any state support of any kind of religious act was a violation. They pointed to legal precedents saying so, and perhaps even more importantly, they pointed to, to history saying that there was this clear separation of church and state. The notion of a wall of separation between church and state, which comes from a Jefferson letter to the Danbury Baptists, talking about the importance of maintaining clear spheres of authority, religious authority and, and secular state authority, gets read into constitutional law, not just in one case, but in a series of cases over time. Justice Black says, this is what the court said the First Amendment meant then. Plus, Jefferson was a good friend of Madison. And Madison had a hand in writing the First Amendment to the Constitution. So what Jefferson thought, surely Madison thought, since they were on the same side of these political battles in Virginia and in the early Republic. You know, in Engel versus Vital, a state-level um, institution or bureaucracy wrote the prayer and strongly recommended that local school districts adopt the prayer and require the prayer to be said. That's what the local school district then did in Engel versus Vital. And the United States Supreme Court said, that's establishing religion. That may not be establishing religion in the sense of, uh, you know, establishing a national religion, but that is government too much in the business of promoting religion. Just seven of the nine Supreme Court justices ruled on this case. Justice Byron White had recused himself, and Justice Felix Frankfurter had suffered a stroke and was therefore unable to participate. When a decision was reached, six of the seven justices ruled in favor of the parents, with Justice Potter Stewart dissenting. The majority contended that by providing a prayer for students to recite in class, the New York State Board of Regents had violated the First Amendment's Establishment Clause. The court also explained that even though the prayer was non-denominational and students could choose whether or not to recite it, the prayer still violated the Constitution. In his opinion for the court, Justice Hugo Black wrote, The Establishment Clause, unlike the Free Exercise Clause, does not depend upon any showing of direct governmental compulsion and is violated by the enactment of laws which establish an official religion whether these laws operate directly to coerce non-believing individuals or not. But the purposes underlying the Establishment Clause go much further than that. Its first and most immediate purpose rested on the belief that a union of government and religion tends to destroy government and to degrade religion. When we talk about who the government is, that is a very, very broad definition. It could be uh, you know, a state agency, it could be a school district, it is any entity or agency that is associated with state government or federal government, and no matter what shape or form it can take. So in other words, um, your school principal is the government because he is part of this state school system that is put into place by the state itself. Uh, and so as a result, he is a government actor. So when we think about the government, you know, just don't think about FBI agents or the governor or the president of the United States or any member of his cabinet. It's everyone who is involved in an agency or a school district or a teacher even, even the teacher at the head of your class, if the school is a public school, who qualifies as a spokesperson for the government. Justice Black also addressed the argument that some might find the court's ruling an indication of hostility toward religion or prayer. He pointed out that if there were no law requiring a certain prayer to be used, those who wanted to could still find a place in which they could pray when they pleased to the God of their faith in the language they chose. Justice William O. Douglas wrote a concurring opinion in which he examined the many aids to religion that are provided by government, such as chaplains in both houses of Congress and in the armed services. However, Douglas noted, the Bill of Rights does not allow either a state or the federal government 
quote, to adopt an official prayer and penalize anyone who would not utter it. Justice Potter Stewart, the only justice to dissent, disagreed with his colleagues in the court, citing several examples of how government already fosters religion, including the fact that since 1865, the words, in God we trust, have appeared on our coins. In his dissent, Justice Stewart wrote, The court has misapplied a great constitutional principle. I cannot see how an official religion is established by letting those who want to say a prayer say it. On the contrary, I think that to deny the wish of these school children to join in reciting this prayer is to deny them the opportunity of sharing in the spiritual heritage of our nation. And so Justice Stewart said that he thought that the majority had it wrong. That uh, that the court should not ignore uh, the fact of religion in our day-to-day -day, uh, existence. What this decision says is that the state cannot require as a part of its school day any kind of religious activity. There's a great line, as long as there are math exams, there'll be prayers in public schools. An individual student can pray on his or her own. Um, in whatever gap in the day there is. Students can use school facilities after school, for example, or before school to engage in religious-based behavior. What can't happen is that the state can't require you to do that or can't give you a benefit for having done that. The key word is always neutrality, and, and that means that determinative in many of these school cases is where's the prayer coming from? If that prayer is bubbling up from the grassroots, from the students themselves, those students are not governmental officials. They're not limited by the Constitution. They're protected by the Constitution. Their free exercise rights are protected from the public officials or the teachers or coaches or principals saying, don't pray, don't pray, can't do that. You can't tell kids not to pray. You want to pray in silence before the math test, during the math test? Uh, the school can't stop you. Uh, you want to pray out loud in the hallway between classes with a small group? The school cannot stop you. Uh, you want to pray before the school day, in the locker room before the big game, on the field uh, uh, before the kickoff? The school can't stop you. The coach cannot stop you. You have uh, uh, a free exercise right in the First Amendment to exercise your religion, and the government has to stand back and be neutral and let that religious practice occur. Engel is an important case because it shows the delicate balance that we have to strike between the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. We don't want a state-sponsored church, but at the same time, we do want to be able to freely exercise our beliefs. Is school prayer a violation of the Establishment Clause? Is being allowed to pray in school an exercise of, of your religion? These are tough questions, and these are the questions that the court had to answer in Engel. 